Hello everyone and welcome back to the inevitable decline of my psyche through the tortured medium of literature. We're not playing games today, my dear viewers. I've made a lot of videos on influencer books, and I think despite my many critiques, I've found reasons why people read them. Gabby Hanna's poetry can be entertaining, even if not for the reasons she desires. Lily Singh's book may have inspired someone somewhere. Lele Pons's book inspired my music career. Actually, that's probably not a good thing. I don't want you to read today's book. Quite frankly, I wish I never read it myself. I definitely knew it was going to be bad, which is why I've tackled it in halves with my dear friend Pinely. If you really don't feel satisfied by by the almost spine-tingling cringe presented in this work, then please be my guest. Do go and suffer more by watching his video. It's not a cohesive novel, if that makes sense. It's a collection of essays, so it made sense to split it up. Bit of context for you, by the way, this video is gonna work like any other bad book club. I'm gonna be critiquing this, analyzing it. I'm also going to be referring to another recording I made with Pinely a week or so ago, where we read a few of these essays for the first time. We did this for both my video and his video. We planned those recordings over three weeks ago. We we then recorded his a week after that. We were also meant to do my recording on that day, but we were both exhausted, so we postponed it to the day after. We then postponed it to the week after. I then took another week to read the rest of the essays. I finished the script for this video earlier today, and here I am at three in the morning. And let me clarify, throughout this three weeks, I've not been busy. I've just been traumatized. So in short, don't read this book. There may be some masochists among us, don't make the joke, that will actually want to spend their money and time reading this. Um. Don't. It's merely a collection of elongated low blows of edgy tangents to distract you from the sheer lack of any glimpse of content worthy of $10 of your hard-earned money. But alas, this is my job, apparently, and I wouldn't be doing a good job if I didn't take you through every chapter that I have read. Quick shout out to the first essay, My High School Musical. Any real James Marriott fans out there will have already seen my video on Shane Dawson's short film. That short film was made to promote this very book. No clue why Shane's team wanted him to advertise this. Maybe just expend that energy by referring him to a psychologist. As you'd expect, the essay is very similar in content to the short film, so if you want to learn more about this essay for some absurd reason, go watch my video on the short film. Spoiler alert, you don't care about spoilers. Shane decides to audition for the high school musical. He has a crush on a girl called Patty who gets a leading role. She seems talented and invincible on the outside, but on the night of the performance, she struggles with self-confidence and Shane gives her a pep talk. And in the process, he realizes that even people who seem perfect struggle with their own issues. But we're not here for a moral pilgrimage. We're here to suffer. For some reason, Shane uses this book to admit to delinquencies he committed when he was younger. In this essay, he confesses that he used to go through Del Taco drive throughs and pretend that he has Tourette's. The number of times I went through a Del Taco drive through and acted like I had Tourette's syndrome was countless. <laughs> What? You know what you <laughs> I have reason to believe this is true. Why you'd ever admit or even do something like this? Why does he do that? I hope he doesn't do it anymore. <laughs> you think he still goes around pretending yeah. that he has Tourette's? Now, some of you may be doubting the validity of this story, and I agree. I also don't think that Shane would have had friends. But it's not a one-off anecdote. He really drills home that he used to do this. We should try out for the musical. What? Why? Can't we just pretend we have Tourette's and go through the Burger King drive-thru again? <laughs> Is that all he does? He really wants to drive <laughs> home the fact that he does that. You, like, you'd think that that would be something that he, like, would try to hide. <laughs> He keeps repeating <laughs> the fact that he does that. Yeah. I don't really want to believe that anyone above the age of 10, let alone Shane Dawson, would act like this. And I wouldn't blame you if you thought that this was just some fictional spiel that Shane came up with out of nowhere to increase the word count. But the end of the chapter somewhat reasserts the realism behind this work. If you want to see pictures, just Google Shane Dawson fat wearing safari hat 2006. Did you Google that? I have Googled that. <laughs> and this is why it makes me uncomfortable because it there is a strange amount of reality. Oh, wow. Do you think he was dressed up like that when he was pretending that he has Tourette's? It's the fedora that does it. <laughs> it's a whole thing. Look at him. Wow. It makes you think what else? <laughs> yeah. What else of what, what else he's saying is, is real. I think all of these essays are based in truth, in real things that actually happened in Shane's life. Obviously, elements of the those truths will be exaggerated. Hopefully this is one of those elements. But as you begin to tally up the many wrongdoings presented in this book, you've really got to wonder 
wonder just how many of them may have actually happened. In Two First Kisses, Shane addresses his first sexual experiences and relationships. It's a nice touch that Shane has provided some fan art for each of these essays, but this one makes me feel a little bit uncomfortable. He includes a little description about the person who did this drawing. Sydney Levine is 14 years old. And here's a drawing she did of me making out with someone. Leaves somewhat of a sour taste on the palette, doesn't it? This essay goes deeply in depth about Shane's first ever kisses, both at the tender age of 21. These are very real moments which happened in Shane's life with very real people. In the following clip, Shane describes who he had his first kiss with, someone who would actually later become his girlfriend. She was sweet, pretty, and a little older than me, even though it was only by a couple of years. Given my lack of sexual experience, I might as well have been 12. Although I think 12 year olds get more hand jobs than I do. Oh. <laughs> What the fuck? <laughs> Very regular thing to think about, right? Why would he say that? Again, there's just no need. I struggle to find the words to describe my opinion on these kinds of moments in this book because yes, there are fucking plenty. On page 33, the page before what you just heard, by the way, Shane writes, At the time, I was pretty religious and the thought of having sex before marriage made my guilty Christian penis crawl back up inside my guilty Christian body. Shane almost has a gift for writing really visceral and uncomfortable things. So you can only imagine what his description of his first first kiss is like. All I remember is thinking how much her lips felt like bologna with mayonnaise smeared on it. And that was a good thing. Jesus Christ. <laughs> that poor woman. Imagine being hired to kiss Shane Dawson, which is bad enough. And then after that, he talks all this shit about you in his book. Uh, well, to him it's good. Yeah. But to the average listener, Jesus Christ. I don't know if you really processed what I said earlier, but the kiss he just described is with someone who would end up becoming his girlfriend. Imagine being that girl and reading this book. He has equated your lips to this, a fucking sausage. Maybe that's why he enjoyed the kiss so much. With mayonnaise smeared on you it. See what I mean? He doesn't leave anything to the imagination, does he? It wasn't lightly seasoned with some black pepper. It was smeared. Smeared with juicy white sauce. Yumma yumma. And once you've gotten over the shock of kiss one, you remember that unfortunately, you're not just here for one kiss. The difference is that the first kiss happened for a video and the second kiss happened naturally. So I started kissing her hand and then slowly made my way up her arm. I got to her shoulder, and then I went to her neck. As I made my way up to her face, she was trembling. <laughs> <laughs> That's not the word you use! She was terrified! Every detail just makes it worse. Imagine just sitting there while he's starting to kiss your arm. Oh. Oh. The worst thing is Shane ends this paragraph by saying that he thought he did a good job in this interaction. He felt as if he came across as a player. But trembling? That's not a very positive sounding word. Trembling. To shake involuntarily as with fear or cold. To be fair, if someone was kissing me like I was a slice of chorizo, I'd also be shaking in fucking terror. One of the most glaring elements of this chapter are the incestuous undertones. Needless to say, if I was to write an essay on my first romantic moments, I'd probably avoid mentioning my mum and my grandma. On page 33, Shane writes that my mum and I used to cuddle on the couch and watch shows about women getting brutally murdered. Cuddling on the couch, we can let this slide once. I don't really know what it's like to have a loving family so any kind of familiar physical contact makes me feel rather uncomfortable. You know what, I'm so numbed by the experience of reading this book that I completely forgot what he says at the end of the sentence about watching women getting brutally murdered. At this point, I'm unfazed. I've clearly built up some kind of cursed tolerance. On page 38, however, it does get a little bit more explicit. When talking about his first ever girlfriend, Shane writes that it was more of a friendship with some kissing thrown in. Kind of like the relationship I'd have with my grandma, but more culturally acceptable. Obviously this is a joke, right? Obviously yeah, Shane. Tell me this is a joke, Shane. I can neither confirm nor deny the validity behind this throwaway joke. Maybe him and his mum actually watch shows about animals getting brutally murdered. Maybe they never actually cuddled. Maybe he got bored of the show and went in the other room to fuck his grandma. I simply don't know. What I do know is that incest is not a one-off bit in these essays. In fact, in the seventh essay titled My Birthday Suit, there's this really gross description of Shane's mum's swimming suit. Even as a young kid, I remember thinking, is my mom a whore? The suit was tight, black, and had an open back. It was tasteful, yet sensual. I have no words. <laughs> He's described his own mom as sensual. That is such a weird way to describe your mom. All the details he went into and all of that, it's just... It's odd. Wow. Who asked for this description? And why, after you've just written about your mom, are you thinking about vaginas? He describes the swimsuit as the tight black suit with the worn out crotch pads. It's the adjectives here that get me more than anything. Tight and worn 
out. For the word tight to have come to mind, he must have looked at his mum wearing the swimsuit and gone, wow, that's fitting her nice and snug. Really defining those curves. And then when she wasn't wearing the swimsuit, he must have picked it up and looked at the crotch pad for long enough to know that it's worn out. Why are you analyzing your mum's crotch pad? That's a real sexy swimsuit. The crotch pad smells of anchovies. The most disgusting sections of this book lie in descriptions like these. Even a couple of pages earlier, on page 85, Shane describes his body. Sometimes when I lie in bed, I can still hear the suction sound of my fingers pulling my wet shirt from the deep cleavage between my boy tits. Why did you say this? Why did I have to hear this? Why? Anyone who unironically uses the term boy tits should be imprisoned for life. Those two words are simply not meant to be put together. I know a lot of Shane's earlier work was built solely to shock people, so in a way this is working, but I don't like the person he's portraying himself as, and there's no real value in shock like this. I'm not enjoying it, edgy people wouldn't enjoy it, it's just gross. But then you have this dichotomy of sorts, I don't think that word has been used in a single review of this book, when I hate my selfie is not being gross, it's just plain boring. In the essay, the mean girl got fat, the, um, the mean girl got fat. That's pretty much all I got from this essay. Someone who went to the same high school as Shane and used to bully him comes to the weight loss center he is now working at. He wants to get revenge on her, but then she reveals how depressed she is. He starts to feel bad for her and chooses a good counselor for her to start to lose some of her weight. He then tells her that he is the Shane from high school. You may remember me from the musical. She apologizes for how she treated him and she drives off. Hand on heart, I have read this chapter so many times to try and find something to joke about. C'est impossible. There is nothing here. It's completely devoid of content. It's essentially just a work diary. Imagine, for, for just a second, you've had a hard, long day at the office. You've just got back home. You want to sit back, relax, and enjoy one of Shane's Nobel Prize-worthy essays. You flip open the book, and you're just reminded of how boring your nine to five is. Because there's nothing interesting about this. It's nothing more than an icebreaker at a high school reunion. And even then, it wouldn't provoke much of a conversation. You'd just reply, oh, she got fat. I never would have expected that. And move on. The essay, My Girl's Space Friends, is equally as tedious. It is what it says on the tin. Once again, a vague commentary on Shane's female friends. Definitely has a lot of those. I don't know how much I want to talk about this chapter because I feel like there's this, this one moment I can't stop thinking about. But if I bring any attention to it, this video will just get age restricted. If you're interested, go to page 136. I have that burned into my memory. In the second paragraph, he talks about a friend he had when he was 11 years old. Let me just say, when you have to contextualize something you did when you were 11 with the sentence it wasn't sexual at all you know there's a fucking problem in the same paragraph he calls himself a pussy pirate and a pathological liar i promise you I am not insane. I'm not making any of this up. These are all direct quotes. Why did you make me read this book? Is it weird that I've never felt so comforted by someone saying they're a pathological liar? It gives me hope that a lot of this never actually happened. He then hones in on his friend Kate, who he met as a teenager. This is essentially the focus of the essay. When they were 18 years old, they questioned whether they wanted to date or not, and they collectively decided it was a bad idea. Um... Sorry, were you expecting anything else? That's the end of that essay. Do you want me to do like a little dance or something? I can't make content about a lack thereof. Let me try and find something of note, hold on. Oh, oh yeah, on page 140, Shame admits to trimming his ball hair using his mum's moustache scissors. Are you happy now? Is that something you wanted to know? In the essay titled Astral Projection, Shane talks about his ongoing passion for dog walking. Just kidding, he talks about astral projection. For those of you that don't know what an astral projection is, it's essentially an out of body experience but it also suggests the existence of an astral form. So our astral form can leave our physical form through projection. This could mean interacting with the world of spirits and also seeing things in other rooms. He really dedicates an essay in an attempt to convince the reader that this is something that he can do. Call me Taylor Swift, right? Because I don't know about you, but I'm feeling like this is a load of horse shit. There's something about him calling himself a pathological liar that makes me want to distrust him. On page 177, he goes in depth about an altercation he had with an evil spirit. Apparently this dude was trying to steal Shane's body and what ensued was a long, violent battle between me and this dark, cold mass. Also an accurate description of his beef with Anision. But it is crazy how this just 
never happened. Because, you know, even if it did happen, it just didn't, though, did it? You're either lying or stupid, and I don't know which one's worse. I've decided to tackle the last two essays together because they're both symptomatic of the wider issue around this book and Shane's career in general. To put it lightly, this has not aged well. Then again, I can't imagine anyone from 2015 thinking that any of the content in this book is anywhere close to socially acceptable. Specifically, I'm talking about the essays Internet Famous and Shock Tuber. In Internet Famous, Shane talks about the first few times he was recognized in public. It doesn't stop him from creating a disgusting tangent in the introduction. We were eating shitty cheap Mexican food with what was probably dog meat in the taco filling and talking about all the times we had carded. For those of you who don't know, carded is a term used to describe the classy act of simultaneously coming while farting. You ever done that? <laughs> As I was mid-story about one incident where my dog licked my butthole while I was masturbating and I didn't push him away. Come on, we've all been there. In 45 seconds, in 45 seconds, he insults Mexican people, talks about cum farts, and admits to bestiality. What <laughs> the fuck? He got a Shane Dawson bingo. I actually believe him with that last part. <laughs> about yeah. the dog. I genuinely believe that he did that. In the clip I just showed, Shane is talking about that occurrence in a restaurant, which is the first place he gets recognized. The second time he writes about is in a doctor's office. He's going for a physical examination. He's asked if this is the first one he's ever had, and he replies this. Yeah, the closest I've ever had to a physical was my mom cleaning up my dick cheese when I was 12. Uh. <laughs> it's so gross! If you want my reaction to this comment at this point, I feel nothing. I'm merely a shell of the human I once was. Please subscribe to my fucking YouTube channel. What hasn't aged well about this chapter is, well, everything I've just mentioned, but also the doctor's assistant told the whole office that Shane was there, and they were all very excited. They love it when, I quote, you put on that wig and act all ghetto. That definitely happened. Medical professionals loved his portrayal of Shanane. Ignore the fact that they just diagnosed him as a pathological liar. And if him trying to convince himself that these characters he had were loved isn't enough, in Shocktuber, he essentially offers a non-apology for the racist comment Content he made in the past. It's the penultimate essay in this book. I can't believe I'm almost done with this. And it feels somewhat like a conclusion, as if to say, who cares what I've said in this book? At least I'm not a racist, right? He writes about one of the first times that he was cancelled. Apparently his timeline was filled with thousands of Shane Dawson is racist and Shane Dawson hates black people tweets. People were pointing out every offensive joke he's ever made. And he responds in this book by accepting people's qualms and apologizing for his past actions. You really get the feeling that he's changed and also that I'm lying because none of that actually happens. He responds to the backlash by doubling down. Doubling down on racism. But first he gives a few excuses for his jokes. Number one, I'm not racist. I wasn't involved in that one incident that happened that one time. I tried to set the record straight and explain that I had nothing to do with the video, but that went unheard. I mean, maybe he had nothing to do with that video. What about all the blackface? Yeah, that's the thing. It's like, I'm not racist because I didn't have anything to do with this one case. With this one specific thing. <laughs> you know all of those other offensive jokes I just mentioned? Don't worry about those. I didn't do this one other thing. I'm not racist. Number two. I'm not racist, it's my environment. My humor was created by my environment. Margaret Cho isn't considered a racist for making jokes about Asians and their stereotypes because it's what she grew up with. It's what she knew. And the same goes for me. I'm not racist. It's the fault of the racists around me. It's just such a shitty excuse, honestly. Yeah, blaming your environment for the way you are and not being willing to change. I like how he says it in that voice of like, I can't help it. It's just how I grew, I grew up. That's it's just, just me. how I Good grew up, man. Chain. That's just me. You need to accept me. You gotta accept me for who I am. A racist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. To add to this clip, he compares himself to Margaret Cho, who, and I'm quoting, isn't considered a racist for making jokes about Asians and their stereotypes because it's what she grew up you with. You know Margaret Cho? Margaret Cho of South Korean heritage, both of her parents being from South Korea, herself being Asian. So she's not racist for making jokes about Asian people, but I am for making jokes about black people? Uh, yes. That is how that works. Uh, she is Asian and you are white. That is very much how it works. And number three, I'm not racist. I have black friends. That day after the performance, one of my teachers, who was white, asked me if I thought the skit was racist. Luckily, I had a friend stick up for me and risk getting detention to do so. My friend happened to be black. Shane Dawson has black friends. <laughs> He's not racist. <laughs> this can't be racist. I have a black friend. These are the worst are excuses. About? He's talking to his teacher. Uh, hello, look at this guy. <laughs> 
I'm not a racist. <laughs> he really took three whole shots trying to excuse his past behaviours and missed with every single one. It's a thing of beauty. He even writes, Now, I know it sounds like I'm making that conversation up. It's too perfect and too well crafted to be an actual conversation between a high school student and his teacher. And to be honest, I think I'll leave the quote like that because if I read any more, I'll start disagreeing with it. There's no apology here, but why should there be? When he wasn't involved in that one racist thing, uh, it's his environment's fault, not his, and he has black friends. That's the fucking trifecta of not being racist. For any Americans out there, the thing you just heard me say uh, was sarcasm. I'm never getting these three weeks of my life back. That's all thanks to this book, and to be honest, I think it'll be in my mind for a lot longer. It's only been six years since it was released, and it hasn't aged well. It's non-apology for not aging well also hasn't aged well. This is the only time in Bad Book Club where I felt that every single copy of this book should be burned, and I don't think Shane would disagree with me. And as I said at the beginning of this video, what I've just analysed is only half of this book. If for some perverted reason you want to suffer more, do go and check out Pineley's video over on his channel. It's either out right now or coming very soon. It'll be very similar in content to this video. It'll also have me in it. It's one of the first times that Bad Book Club has actually felt like a club. Please do go and subscribe to him after watching his video. I want him to feel like suffering alongside me was worth it. Leave your book suggestions in the comment section down below. I've been James Marriott. Subscribe.